we've been doing that, but let's just take another moment. If you need to, children want to be dismissed, y'all are welcome to go to Children's Church at this time. But let's worship the Lord. Father, we worship you this morning. We praise you. We magnify you. We honor you. We lift up the name of Jesus. We, we honor the presence of Holy Spirit in our midst. We give you first place, Holy Spirit, to move and to minister today. We thank you, Lord God, that there's no sickness, there's no disease, that there's no bondage that can remain in this place today. There's no bondage that can remain in any person's body, in any person's mind today. We've been set free by the Spirit of God. We've been set free by Jesus, by the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Son of God. So today I declare freedom and victory in each and every person's life that's present in this place today. And we declare it with our voice. We declare it with everybody say, I'm free. I'm free. Let's say it like we mean to say, I'm free. I'm free. Glory to God. We are free, and the Bible says we are free indeed. Amen. Well, you can be seated today. Amen. That's, that, that word freedom just continues to go over and over in my spirit this morning. Free. Free. Amen. You know, sometimes you may not feel free. <laughs> can somebody say amen? amen? Have you always felt free every moment of every day of your life? No, we don't always feel that way, but see, we don't go by our feelings, amen? amen. We go by what the Word of God said. That song is an awesome song, amen, uh, and the, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is so abundant today, amen, and it's free, and it's flowing. You know, I, I was, uh, like I said, as I was thinking about that word freedom, it, it made me think about Paul and Silas. You know, Paul and Silas got put in jail when they were right in the middle of the will of God. They wasn't in di disobedience. You know, they wasn't out living up. You know, they, they, they didn't arrest them inside the bar because they were drunk and carrying on and, and got in a bar fight and took them to jail. No, they arrested them. Why? When they were preaching the gospel. When they were right in the center of the middle of the will of God preaching the gospel, they arrested them and put them in jail for preaching the gospel. But right in the middle of the darkest hour, you know, the Bible says at midnight, which represents the darkest hour, they begin to do what? Belly ache and complain and, and, and cry and say, Lord, why me? Why did you put us here? No, they didn't do that. What did they do? They began to sing praises. And they began to shout and lift up their voice. The, the, the Bible says that all the prisoners, in the prisoners in the prison could hear them because they lifted up their voice and they began to shout and sing praises unto the Lord right in the middle of the prison. Now, they had sh shackles on their feet and stocks on their hands, and they were bound in the physical realm. But in the spiritual realm, they knew who they were in Christ Jesus, and they began to sing praises unto him right in the middle of the prison. And they began to act like they were free, right? And what happened? We know that an earthquake came. All the shackles were broken. Glory to God. They, they walked free. And everybody in the prison walked out and was free. But they didn't leave. They didn't run away. And the jailer was there. And he drew the sword to kill himself because he, he knew that, that if he was the one on duty and the, 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 whoever was over him, the captain, saw that the, the people were free, he knew that, that his life would be taken, right? The king would take his life. So he was ready to kill himself. But Paul said, no. He said, don't, don't, don't do it. He said, we're all here. Don't kill yourself. We're all here. And, and then what did he do? He led him to the Lord, got him born again right there on the spot, got him born again. So see, what we have to realize is that we don't always feel free. The circumstances may not always look like we're free. The pain in your body may not always feel like you're free. But in the middle of that, we have to realize through Jesus, he's already made us free. Amen. We're going to look at it. We're talking about discipleship today. Uh, we're going to continue where we... Uh, we're at last week, and you say, well, what does that have to do with discipleship? Well, in order for us to disciple another person, we have to realize that we're free. Amen. To see, to lead somebody else into freedom, that we've got to experience freedom ourselves. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. We have to experience freedom ourselves, so we have to remind ourselves that no matter what we feel like, no matter what it looks like, no matter the circumstances, we're free because of what Jesus did. Now, we quoted this last week, but I'm going to mention it right here because it fits so well. But in John chapter 8, it says that. It says, he who the Son has set free, is free indeed. And he was talking to a certain uh, group of Jews that were listening to him, and they believed on Jesus. And they said, uh, you know, no, teach us. Explain this to us. And he began to talk about that. And he said, well, look, we're, we're, we've never been bound to anybody. We're children of Abraham. You know, we're, we're a descendant of Abraham. We've never been bound to anyone. We're not, we're not in bondage. And if you go on down and read it, it's, it talks about the fact that, that Jesus said that anyone that serve sin or that anyone that practices sin is a prisoner to sin. See? So the world sometimes looks at 
if you want to call it church or what we're doing today, we may be doing church, but we are, we are the church. You know, we may be coming to church, but actually we're the body of Christ. We are the church. Amen. It's not a building. It's not a, a structure, but the Spirit of God lives on the inside of us. We're the called out ones, the ecclesia. Amen. Called out. Amen. So sometimes the world looks at church and they said, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with that because if I go, if I start going to church, if I become a Christian, I'm going to have to change certain things. You know, I'm going to have to quit doing this. I'm going to have to quit doing that. I'm going to have to, you know, whatever. You ever been, you ever thought that before? I know I did. I, but, the, but the problem with me at school when I was a young person, the same kids that I knew went to church did the same things I was doing on Friday and Saturday as, as the ones that went to church. So I said, I don't want to have any part to do with it anyway. See? But that was wrong. That was wrong, too. That was a wrong thought process. But see, people look at it and they say, well, if I become a Christian, then I'm going to get under bondage. I'm going to put myself under bondage. Like a list. I can't do this, can't do that, can't go there, can't do it. I'm going to put myself in bondage. I won't have freedom to do what I want to do. If I want to have a drink, I, you know, then I'm going to feel condemned if I have a drink. If I want to go out and, and do this or go to a party, whatever, I can't go do that. Well, you know, there may be some truth to that. We're not saying that when you become a believer that, that it gives you an excuse. See, grace is not an excuse to sin, but grace gives you the power and the ability to live free from sin. But see, we've got to bring the true picture of who God is and what God is to the world. Amen. And that's our responsibility as a believer. We're, you know, we're, we're a, a reflection of Jesus. Christian means Christ-like, right? So what we have to realize is to set someone else free and to take freedom to someone else, we have to walk in that freedom. Amen. So we have, to, we have to make a decision, a choice, that while we're experiencing something that may look like bondage, something that may feel like or seem like we don't have the victory, in the middle of all those things, we have to, Shout the victory. Amen. We have to sing praises unto the Lord where, where we still feel like we're not experiencing the victory because in Christ we already are free. Amen. So I just want to encourage you that today, remind you of that today because we've all been there. You may feel like that now. You may be dealing with something now, but you have to declare right in the middle of the situation. You have to look it right in the eye and say, I'm free. I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You have to let your mountain hear your voice. You have to let your situation hear your voice. See, on Monday morning, the pastor may not be there. On Monday morning, the praise team may not be there. Monday morning, you may be in a situation. You know, Paul and Silas, they didn't have, you know, they didn't have Spotify. Paul and Silas didn't have Apple Music on their, on their iPhone. They couldn't click a button and somebody start singing and encourage them. No, they encouraged themselves, right? I mean, if you just try to put yourself in their position, think about it. I mean, you're you right in the middle of the will of God doing what he calls you to do, preaching the gospel, and you wind up in jail. Now, you know your mind would start questioning, well, why, Lord? Why this? I'm doing this. I'm whatever. And see, there's situations and times in our life where we're doing the will of God. It's not that we're off track. We're in the middle of the will of God, but there's challenges that come, situations that come, things in life because we're, you know, we live in this world. And the scripture tells us that while we're in this world, there will be troubles and situations and trials. But what did he tell us? Be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. How do you, how do you have good cheer? Well, that means that, that, that we have a praise in our mouth. Amen. It means we have a song on our tongue. It means we have a smile on our face. And sometimes we have to do that just like David did. We have to encourage ourselves. And sometimes you have to start off in the flesh. Most of the time you will. <laughs> Because you don't just wake up in the spirit and, you know, you have to start out in the flesh and begin to sing praise. You have to begin to stir up yourself. You have to begin to, begin to praise the name of the Lord. And sometimes it may not be easy. But if you'll continue, glory to God, if you'll continue and don't quit, continue and don't give up. And don't listen to the lies of the enemy. Don't listen to your body and begin to declare this is who I am in Christ. The promise of God, as Kristen mentioned, and also as a song that every promise of God is yes and amen through Christ Jesus. Amen. And it's a settled fact, and it is done. And if you have that attitude, and if you have that witness and that voice, the devil is already defeated, but what you're doing is you're reminding him of his defeat. Amen. Uh, glory to God. Amen. And things will begin to turn around. They've already turned around. They've already, it's already finished. Amen. But in your world, in your situation, you have to settle it. Amen? Yes. And it'll be settled. Glory to God. Well, if you join us today from Facebook, we'd like to say welcome. Hallelujah. I believe God's got a good uh, word for you today. Every scripture is God breathed, Amen. And uh, I've got a uh, something for I believe it's for somebody on Facebook today. It, it could be for somebody in here. There was a couple of weeks ago, um, the Spirit of God spoke something to my heart, 
And I heard, uh, I don't, you probably never heard him, but there's a minister named Reza Safa. He's from Iran. I know there's a lot going on right now in different countries of the world, but he's over TBN's affiliate of the Middle East. And he said one day he was recording a show. He recorded sometimes two months in advance. And he was recording a program, and he said uh, while he was recording it, the Spirit of God spoke to him, and he said, look to the camera, and he said, declare uh, and speak directly to someone that will be watching this program. And he said there's some young man that's watching this program today, he said, that's, that's contemplating taking his life. And he began to talk about and prophesy about the Spirit of the Lord. He said, uh, you just came home from work, and you're sitting down in the living room, and you turn on the TV, and he said, you've been contemplating taking your life. And what happened, this young man had come home, and, and that's exactly what he did. He had already planned it out to take his life, and he went in. He said, well, I'm going to go get me a, a drink of water and, and, and sit down for a minute. If I'm going to do this, he said, you know, I don't have to be in a hurry about it. <laughs> so he goes in and gets him a drink of water, comes in and sits down turns on the TV. And as he turns on the TV, Razor Sofa comes on. Now, you have to realize he rec recorded a program two months prior to this day. And he starts to tell the young man, you'll go, you're coming home from work. You're going to go in the kitchen to get a drink of water. You're going to come in the living room and sit down and watch TV. And the guy, everything that he had said, that's what he was doing. He said, you plan on taking your life. And he began to tell him that, you know, the, the devil is the father of all lies. And the voice that you've been hearing is from hell. See, this man didn't know Jesus. And he said, but I'm, come to, I'm here to tell you today that there's a man named Jesus that came over 2,000 years ago. And he walked this earth and he gave his life for you. And he went through the, I'm not going to go through the whole story, but he went through the process. And the young man cried out to Jesus right there through a TV program that was recorded two months prior and gave his life to the Lord. Amen. And this was several weeks back. And it, it may apply to someone here. And it may apply to someone, I believe it's for someone watching. But the Lord said a couple weeks ago that there's someone here that will be under the sound of your voice that's had those same thoughts and temptations. And there's no condemnation of that. I've had those thoughts. I don't know when it was, somewhere around the year of 2006, 7, somewhere in there, the same thing that the enemy came to me one day and he said, look, he said, your wife uh, 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 would be better off without you. He said, you've got a good insurance policy. I said, this is how the devil operates. He said, you've got a good insurance policy. Your wife will be well taken care of. You're not, you're, you're, you're not a good husband anyway. You're not a good father. You're not a good husband. Uh, you, you're not a good minister. You're not a good this. You're not a good that. You're not a good business leader. What, whatever he could think of, he began to tell me this. And I was riding down the road. And he said, look, he said, there's a curve coming up here. And he said, it's got a big drop off. He said, the best thing for you to do is to drive off that. And he said, it'll be over with. And, and he said, look like an accident. And he said, like, you know, everything will be covered. The insurance cover, policy will cover everything. Everything will be taken care of. The house will be paid for. On and on. All these things he's just laying out. You know, man, it just... He's he just, he just laying out his plan. And all of a sudden, I started to think about it. I said, well, you know, you may be right. You know, that might be the truth. You know, yeah, I, I see how that could work. And see, I was having those feelings, feelings, you see, feelings anyway. I was having those thoughts anyway, but those thoughts and those feelings are not coming out of your spirit, man. They're coming out of your mind, and they're coming out of your flesh. And you have to renew this mind, and you have to remind this mind what the Word of God says, you have to remind this mind and this flesh of, of, of what the truth is. Amen. So I began to, I rose, the Spirit of God rose up on the inside of me, and I began to declare to the devil that was telling me all this thing, he said, no, devil, you're a liar, and I'm not going to drive off the road, I'm not going to take my life, and I am a, a winner because Jesus made me a winner. Amen. Do you hear me? Amen. So you may be here this, today that have dealt with those thoughts, or it may be somebody watching, you may be watching down the road sometime, but I'm declaring by the Spirit of the Lord that the enemy is a liar, and do not listen to those lies, and you look right into the face of those thoughts and feelings, and you command them to leave, bind them in the name of the Jesus. And I want to tell you that he has paid the price and bought you Amen. with a great price, and freedom belongs to you. So I declare right now in the name of Jesus, you're free. You're free from those thoughts of suicide. You're free from thoughts uh, of taking your life. And I declare that the peace of Almighty God right now come and surround you and overtake you. And he begins to reveal the plan and purpose that he created you for in the name of Jesus. Amen. And if there's anyone here today that's dealt with those thoughts, you take that and receive that. Amen. And there's no condemnation. Amen. Amen. You say, well, that, that, you know, that must be a, a rough situation. When I see the devil, he, he can come out of the blue. That's usually when he comes, when you're not even thinking. He'll come out of the blue, and he wants you to take that bait, but don't take it. <laughs> see, God created you with a purpose, an own purpose. And there's, only, there's certain things in this world that only you can do. If God needed someone else, he would have, you know, if he didn't need you, he wouldn't have created you. You see what I'm saying? But there are certain people, 
that you relate to, that you're a witness to, that you'll preach the gospel to that nobody else can reach. Amen. That's how important you are. You're so important that God sent his only son just for you, if it was just you. And on top of that, you're so important, he believes in you. So I want to tell you, think about this. You say, well, I've heard this before. Now, I want you to really understand this. See, there's a difference between an understanding and a revelation. There's a difference between knowledge that you've heard and a revelation of what that knowledge means. See, a revelation is revealed to you. And all of a sudden, you say, oh, I see that. Yes, it makes plain, and it jumps. It's like a scripture that jumps off the page. You say, well, I've read that scripture a hundred times, but, but today it just, it just did something different. It just lit up. It just illuminated. See, that's what revelation is. So I want you to get a revelation today of this fact that, that God believes in you so much. And I know I said this to you last week, but when you wake up every morning, God is counting on you. So he loves you so much. <clears throat> he didn't only give his only begotten son for you, but he, 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 he cleansed you and he made you righteous and holy and without blame so that his spirit could come and live on inside of you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit today. That's where he lives. So that's how much God loves you. That's how important you are to him. That's how much he values you, that you have this treasure hidden in the earthen vessel. Amen. Let that be a revelation to you, not just knowledge that you hear. Don't let it just be another church service, but let that go off on the inside of you. So that way, when your own mind tells you you're not worthy, when your body or, or your past failures try to come up and say, well, you don't, you don't have what it takes. You don't have, you, well, who do you think you are that you're going to make a difference in the kingdom of God? And you step up and say, I know who I am, for I've been bought with a price. I'm a king of kings. I, I, I'm, I'm the, he's a king of kings, but I'm a king under him. I'm a priest. Glory to God, a royal priesthood. <laughs> Glory to God. The spirit of almighty God lives on inside of me. See, you, you begin to declare that. Let that be a revelation, and it'll change things. Glory to God. It'll give you the boldness to go out and fulfill the calling on your life. It'll give you the boldness to, to face each and every day. Amen. So don't let it just be knowledge, but let it be revelation. Let it go off on inside of you. Say, well, how does that happen? Well, it, it comes by meditation. It comes by thinking about it and pondering on it and reading the scripture and letting those scriptures sink in. So there again, back in John chapter 8, it's, it's not the truth that sets you free, but it's the truth that you know that sets you free. Amen. See, in Genesis, it says that Adam knew Eve and she conceived. She didn't conceive by they went on a date down to Dairy Queen, got a milkshake. She didn't conceive because they knew of one another. She didn't conceive because they walked past each other in the hallway. She conceived because they were intimate. And see, when we're intimate with the word of God and the promises of God, and we let those things become real on the inside of us, and we know what the word of God says, see, the, the, the scripture that we know sets us free. Amen. Do you understand? Amen. So it's not just head knowledge. But it's revelation knowledge, the word that we know. So take time to meditate on things. Take time to allow those things to become alive on the inside of you. Amen. And it's that word that we know it will bring freedom. The word that we know will bring freedom. So back to those Jews. They said, well, we're not in bondage to anybody. We're free. We're free. We're not in bondage to anybody. But Jesus went on down and he said, look, he said, those that serve sin, that practice sin, they're in bondage. They're, they're enslaved to that sin. Amen but we're free people today. We're free people today. So when we know that we're free, we understand that we're free, and we walk in that freedom, then we can take someone else with us and lead someone else to that freedom. Amen? Amen. So discipleship, I'm going to read the, that definition again. I'm going to go quickly through some of the things to review. A lot of you were, were, uh, were in different parts of ministry, ministry in the church or out of town that week, so I'm going to hit just the highlights of a few things we talked about and then move on today. But uh, we made this statement, this is what the title of my message was last week, is we are the disciple in discipleship. The word discipleship, but we're the, you got disciple and you got ship. Discipleship is together. So we're the disciple in discipleship. And discipleship can't take place without us. If you take the disciple out of discipleship, you just got ship. And that's the suffix ship. So we are vitally important, can't take place without us. And this is all going to come together. Just, just hold on to what, what we're saying if you weren't here last week because I can't go into detail on it. But without us, discipleship not just can't happen, but it won't happen. It involves us. And we mentioned this, that Jesus isn't here to do it. You know, Jesus can't preach the gospel, right? He's not here to do it. He, he, he gave us the job to do it. Angels can't do it. 
Chat GPT is not called to preach the gospel. Amen. And the Holy Spirit lives in us. So the Holy Spirit is waiting on us to share the good news. He's waiting on us to share the gospel. And we made mention of this in the world that we live in today with all the AI and everything that's going on. You know, people may have a AI husband or AI wife or girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever. But see, people need physical people. They need to touch. You know, I was thinking about this when Mary, it was uh, uh, the brother, I mean, the sister of Lazarus and the sister to Martha. You know, when Jesus was in uh, Martha's home and she, uh, Mary came in and put the, 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 the ointment the expensive perfume on Jesus' feet, you know, and, and then Martha came in and said, you know, Jesus, aren't you concerned about this, that, that, that I'm over here working and doing, and, 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 and Mary's left, and, and I'm over here doing, you know, trying to minister and do things for you and get things ready, and then Jesus said, what? No, Mary's done the needful thing. Amen. Mary's done the most important thing. Amen. See, she's come to worship Jesus, sit at the feet of the master and listen to his teachings, right? Amen. Glory to God. See, she did the the needful thing. She did the thing that was most important. But Jesus, even Jesus himself, he needed people because Jesus was a person just like us. And there's one place in scripture uh, that talks about that. Uh, you know, it said that, that uh, one of them was, was Judas. You know, he got upset and said, well, we could take that and go feed the poor. And the whole time Judas was taking money out of the bag to do other things with it. He was stealing and taking, but then he got offended. And he said, look, don't, don't, don't waste that on Jesus. We can go and feed the poor with it. But Jesus made mention of it that it was uh, leave, it alone, leave her alone and, uh, uh, and let this take place because this, this ointment, this sweet smelling fragrance is preparing me for my burial and for what's about to take place. And I don't remember who said this. It was a commentary that I was reading, but they said that when Jesus was being beaten and bruised and beat to a place where he didn't even re uh, resemble a human anymore, that Jesus could still smell that aroma, of that sweet smell of that fragrance on his body Amen. that she poured on him and it reminded him that, uh, uh, of the love and the the affection that the people, even earthly people had for him. See? Because Jesus was a person just like us. So Jesus needed people. Jesus needed natural people. So people in this world, this earth, people that are living in, in, in bondage to sin and drugs and alcohol and all these situations, they need, uh, they need physical people, bone people that can go and touch and minister and love on them and, 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 and share the gospel because angels aren't called to do it, right? We are. We're called to disciple. We're, we're called to take the freedom that we have and take it to someone else. And people need us. Amen. Amen. They need a physical body. And there's so much going on in the world today with all this AI and all this stuff going on. But see, we have to realize that even when COVID happened, think about that, six feet apart. So stay back, you know, six feet, close the church. Can't have big groups. You, you can't be around people. You can't hug. I want to tell you, hugs are important. Hugs are important. Encouragement is important. People need encouragement. Amen. Think about people that, that you know, you know we're, we're free people. But how many of you know as free people we need encouragement? How many of you does it bless you sometimes if somebody just calls you say how you, you know, just see how you're doing? Or send you a note. I got a note the other day from uh, somebody that kind of surprised me. And it, and it wasn't much to it. It's just, you know, I want to thank you for something that you did and you're such a blessing uh, you know, and it encourages us when we receive encouragement and we're free people. Well, how much more that people that are in bondage to sin and, and all these situations in life, how much more do they need encouragement? Because they're not even free people. So that's how important it is. It's very important. Amen. We need each other. Hugs are important. Glory to God. <laughs> it reminds me of uh, some of you know this man uh, in a business we were part of years ago, but there's a man, he's in heaven now, but it's Charlie Tremendous Jones. He was like 6'3", six, 6'4", six, big old guy. And uh, I was listening to some, some of his stuff a few weeks ago, uh, just some classics on motivation. And, and he said when he had a meeting, he was standing at the back door, and as people came in, uh, you know, it would be men and women, whatever, enter the room. And he said he would hug the men, and he would uh, shake the wife's hand or the women's hand, but he'd hug all the men. He said, well, what? No, that's kind of strange. But that's just the way he was. He said, well, people say, well, why do you do that? He said, well, I did it because most men growing up, they didn't get enough affection. Most men growing up didn't get the, 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 the love and the attention that uh, they should have gotten. And he said, so I want to make sure that I encouraged them and at least gave them a little bit of affection from a manly side, from a leader, from a mentor, so they would know what it was like, even if it was just a brief moment. And the ladies would come in and I'd kiss them on the hand. And, you know, somebody said, 
As I asked him one time, I said, well, wasn't it difficult to stand there all that time and hug all the men as they came in? He said, no, the hard part was him trying to get away. <laughs> he said, you know, if they just be still and let me get it over with, he said, it'd been a lot better. He said, but man, I was trying to, you know, trying to, trying to hold on to him. They're trying to get away. And uh, he's, he's really hilarious, some of the things that he shares. But that's what he would do. He would hug the men and, and shake the hands of the, of the women because he wanted them to know. And he went to this uh, detention center one time for youth. And uh, he, he, you know, he said, I told a joke and I told a story. And he tells a lot of stories. He said, you tell a story and then you, you, you put in the, you know, it's like a baby. You, you know, you have to sometimes get the spoon around like a helicopter or whatever, or airplane, and then you put in the food. And he said, but those kids probably didn't understand anything I said. They probably didn't even remember anything that I said. But at the, at the end of the, the meeting of this detention center, he said, I asked him to come up, lined them all up. He said, there's about 10 young men there that had, I mean, this, was, this wasn't just a little, you know, sprayed a little gra uh, graffiti on something. These were people and young people that had been in a lot of trouble. He said, I, I lined them up and I gave each and every one of them a hug. And then I whispered down on their ear when nobody else could hear. He said, I whispered to every one of them, I just want you to know I love you and God loves you. And he went to the next one and he embraced him and hugged him. He said about two months later, he got a letter from one of those young men. He said, I'm the young man that you told that you loved. Now, he told each young man in that line that he loved him. But there, there was one that responded with a card. And he said, I want you to know that's the first time in my entire life I'd ever had anybody tell me that they loved me. Amen. First time in my entire life. And, and he wrote him in that letter how much of a difference and it inspired him and and how it encouraged him to, to do different and be different and live different. See, it makes a difference. It makes a difference, and that's what people need. Amen? Amen. They need us. God needs us. We're important to the kingdom of God. Glory to God. So uh, I ask you this question as we move on. Is this, this, why, why did you stick in the body of Christ? Why did you stick? I asked you this last week, or why are you here today? Why, why did you stick and stay here why did you stick and, st and stay as a believer, as a Christian? All these years, a lot of you have been saved for years. You know, I've been saved since I was 15. Well, why did I stay? When I got saved at 15, what made me want to come back the next week to church? When I got saved at the age of 15, what made me want to learn more and grow and, and actually grow in my relationship with the Lord? What was it that caused those things? And that's what I asked you last week for you, each and every one of you here. I want you to ask yourself that question. What made you stick? Why, why, why are you still coming to church? Why are you still serving the Lord? Because it was somebody that took time. It was a person that took time to make room in their life for God to use them to minister to you, right? It could be a pastor, a friend, someone that, 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 that stood in the pulpit and preached the gospel and began to teach the precepts of God and they began to stir things up on the inside of you, began to get knowledge and learn that there was a different way to live. But it could have been just somebody that came and, and, and made a friendship with you. Somebody that came and spent time with you and, and said, hey, after church, why don't we go get something to eat? Or we're having this Bible study next week at my home. Why don't you come to it? Or maybe you met them at a, at a restaurant somewhere and you shared the good news with them. You just began to love on them. Or maybe it was somebody at work that just had a problem and you began to love on them and, and, and ask, is there something that I can pray with you about? See, you made room in your life. Somebody made room in their life for you. And because of that reason, we can all look back and think about it that we're here today, right? So we can be that something and that why for someone else. So we need to ask ourselves, why was that? Because we all have an answer. Where there's, there's a reason for each and every one of us. And we can all go back and think about it. I shared some stories last week, but I don't have time today on that. But what we need to do is this. Is we need to be this, the, the why for somebody else. We need to be the why for, for another person. We need to be the why for people that we know in our life. Why will they stick in the kingdom? Why will they come to know the Lord? Why will they begin to grow in their relationship with the Lord? Because we all know people like that. God, I, I'm telling you, if you're like me, and I know you are in a lot of ways, because we've got the Spirit of God living on the inside of us. And God speaks to me on a weekly basis about somebody that I see and run in contact with. Or he'll remind me about an old friend or, or someone that I've known from the past from school, whatever. And he'll begin to put them on my heart. See? And when he does that, we need to, we, we need to make room and, and, and make a decision that we're going to be the why for that person. We're going to go and make a difference in their life if it's just something simple. And we're going to look at some of those ways a little bit later today, but if it's just something simple, make room and make a decision that you're going to help answer that why. Why will they come into the kingdom? Why will they stick? Why will they become a disciple? That's what we're talking about today is discipleship. Amen. Discipleship. Why will they become a disciple? Because there's a difference between a convert and a disciple. They can get fire insurance, but are they going to grow and learn and become a follower 
of Jesus. So we can be the why for that person. Amen. The why for someone else. And it reminded me, uh, I know I've told some of you this story before, but Granny West, and it's nothing bad on her, it's a, it's a positive of what she did. Uh, she wasn't a part of this church, but she went to a revival one time, and I was 12 years old. And uh, she invited me to go, and this is, and I'm not getting into all that story, but I just, that same year of my 12th year of life, I'd almost, I woke up in a hospital, and I'd almost lost my life to alcohol poison. I mean, I, I don't even remember it. I was that close. They couldn't even find a pulse in my body, and I was blue, and I woke up in the hospital. 7.30 in the morning, I woke up on a Sunday morning in the hospital, not even know how I got there. I'm not going to go back into the details of that, but that's where I, that's, that's the, set the, the framework or the groundwork of where I was living at the time, even at 12 years old. And uh, a few months after that, Granny reached out to me, Granny West, and uh, she invited me to come to this revival. So I went to the revival, and that was a good thing, awesome thing. I come into the revival, and I wasn't raised in church. I went to a few Sunday schools with some of my cousins. That's all I knew about Jesus. Like one fellow said, I thought Jesus was like a superhero, you know, like Superman, somebody you see. And, and that's about all I thought about Jesus. You know, I didn't know much about him, and I thought God was going to just out to get me, you know, because my mom always told me, if you, God's going to get you for that. And if you say a cuss word, he's going to write it down and all these things, you know, he's keeping all this list like Santa Claus. And I thought, man, I don't want to serve a God going to get me one day, you know. That, you know, God, God's just out to get us, but he's not. He's a good father. All of our sins have been dealt with and paid for, and we can receive that forgiveness. Amen. So she invited me to this revival. I walk into the door. I, I, I can still go to the church today, but I'll never forget. I don't know what they preached on. I don't know. I, I can't tell you today a word that the preacher said, but I know that the Holy Spirit was there, and the Holy Spirit began to move, and he came on me, and they gave an altar call, some type of call. I don't know if it was. I don't even know. All I know, I was ready for a change, and I was in bondage. I was lost, and I was looking for help. So I get up. And I respond to it, and as I'm walking down the aisle to respond to the altar call, the Holy Spirit of God comes on me, and I just ran. Now, I'm 12 years old, wasn't raised in church. I didn't know what that looked like. I didn't know what it was like to be moved by the Spirit of God. I took off running, and I hit that stage, and it was a long stage. Man, I ran one end of it to the other, and I was dancing in the Holy Ghost, and all of a sudden, I began to speak in this funny language. I thought, man, what in the world's happened? What is that? But it just began to bubble up on the inside of me, and it came out, and I began to speak in other tongues, and I didn't even know what it was. And you're talking about freedom and, and glory to God. Man, I was excited. I was happy. The weight of the world was lifting off on me. I was, I was so condemned in the place that I was living in at the time, even at a 12-year-old boy, of what had happened in my life and what was going on. But I was free for a moment. I was free, glory to God. But you know what happened? As I left that church, that revival that night, and not one person from that church called, not one person followed up, not one person called and said, hey, let me tell you what happened when, when, when you were running that night. Let me, let me tell you what took place when you were praying in the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you what happened, uh, 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 you know, and, and let me help you from here. Let's go. Let's walk, see. Let's continue. And that's what discipleship does. Discipleship is not just becoming converted, but discipleship is becoming a follower. And if somebody would have came into my life and said, look, let's, let's do this, let's do that, let's go, let me show you this, let me, let me befriend you. Let me tell you about what Jesus said about you. Let me share the good news of God with you and open up the word uh, uh, to you and, and, and let you know that you got an inheritance in Christ Jesus. He began to teach me. See, it would have changed everything. That didn't happen for three more years after that. And Pastor Michelle's not here today, but thank God that she began to reach out and call me and invite me to church and share teaching tapes with me and love on me and, 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 and be a witness to me. And that's what caused me to come into the kingdom. And that's where I am Today, and, it, and, and that's the reason that there was something, there was a why in my life that I'm still here today. There's a why in my life that I'm still a, 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 a disciple and a follower of Jesus. And the reason I want to disciple others and bring them into the kingdom. Amen? And that's what we can be for others. But I, want, I wanted to share that story with you to know that's why it's so important. Amen? That's why it's so important when the Holy Spirit says, hey, buy that person's lunch. That's the reason it's so important when a person says, hey, go speak to them and tell them that I love them. You may think, well, man, that's just, you know, I'm just I ate too much pizza for lunch or whatever. But no, I'm telling you, when the Holy Spirit tells you to do something that speaks it, then obey. Let's, let's obey and do it because it can make all the difference in somebody's life. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And we talked about this real quick. We talked about getting messy. You know, we had this room painted last week, right? Chad painted it and did a really good job on it. But when, if you've ever painted at home or if you painted it wherever, you know, we painted so much in the building that we were in, 
You know, I try to forget how to, how to paint. But anytime I painted, if I putted, or I caulked, or I painted, or I rolled paint on or whatever, I got something on me, right? I got putty on me. I got paint on me. I got paint in my hair, whatever. It was on me because I got messy because I was doing a job. And that's what I talked about is, is the fact of this, is when we disciple other people, we have to be willing sometime to get a little messy. Just like when you paint a home, you're going to get it on you, right? You're going to get some paint on you. You're going to get some caulk on you, some putty on you. You're going to get something to become messy. And if you wasn't really, if you wasn't doing anything, if you're just sitting there, you're going to stay clean and, 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 and dry, whatever. You, you're not going to get anything on you. But if you get into the game, amen. And see, that's where God wants us. He wants us involved. He wants us to get into the game and help disciple and lead others to him. So we'll, we have to be willing to, to get messy sometimes. People are messy. How many of you have been messy? We, we've been messy. How many of you know before you came to Jesus, man, you had some mess? We have some mess now. Even though we're believers, we have some attitudes sometimes, right? Do you know Jesus? Think about the disciples for a moment. The ones that Jesus used that was, that was most closely in union and fellowship with him at the time on the earth that walked, man, they was, they was a messed up bunch of people. They had some problems. They had some situations. Peter cut a man's ear off. You know, thank God Jesus was there and put it back on for him. You know, said, look, <laughs> no, we, we, we don't do that. You know, but he had some, he had some zeal. He had some excitement. He was protecting, he thought he was protecting his master. But see, they were some messed up people. So we have some mess, but we have to be willing to get into other people's mess and jump in sometimes with both feet. And sometimes it's inconvenience. I know, uh, and I'm not putting a poor light on anybody, but I know my wife and, and one of my daughters did some things this past week with some people and, you know, and then they just made a decision, hey, we're going we're gonna to do some things that may be a little inconvenient and we're going to go visit and we're going to spend some time with somebody and we had to spend a little bit of money and, and they had some kids and, you know, and, and, and they bought lunch and did different things with them. Well, it took a little time to do that out of their schedule, but they were reaching out to show, hey, that we care. Amen. We're thinking about you. And there's a, there's, there's, a, there's a way that Jesus provided for us to live this an abundant life. See, that's the difference. Somebody could be doomed to hell, and man, that's terrible. We should take the gospel to everyone, right? Amen. But then there's people that may, be, they may have fire insurance, and they may be a convert, but they're not a disciple. And if they're not a disciple, they're not going to live in the abundant life. They're not going to experience the abundant life that Jesus has paid for because it's the truth that we know that sets us free. Amen. Amen. So that's, that's what we do, and we have to be willing to get a little messy, a little involved. And think about it just a minute. I know there's a lot of babies that have come about lately. Amen, Nathan? <laughs> and when we have babies in our life, babies sometimes can be a little messy, right? But they're, but they're such a blessing. Glory to God, I mean, a new life. They're just such a blessing. But sometimes that little blessing can be a little messy. <laughs> and that little blessing can be a little, you know, have some tears. And they can cry in the middle of the night. They can wake you up and the, and the things you have to do to take care of them. And, but that's what we're called to do. We don't, we don't expect a newborn or we don't expect a two-month-old just to get up and take off running and to walk, do we? No, we understand it's a process. It takes time. It's a process. We don't expect them to. And, and then when they do start walking and they fall down, we don't look at them, walk over and say, well, I thought you just, uh, I th you're just pitiful. I just thought you'd learn how to walk. You ought to be walking by now. Get up. Quit that mess. Quit falling down. No, we don't do that. We encourage them. Man, we take videos and send them to everybody. Look, oh, they took the first step and send videos to 1,500 people, you know. And grandma and grandpa and everybody else wanted to see that they took the first step. But we're there for them to what? To encourage them, to love them, to guide them, to teach them, to be an encourager, to be an example. Amen. We don't just throw them out when they make a mistake. You know, everybody says they're just sweet little angels. And, they, you know, and you've heard people say, well, they just love the smell of a newborn or, or an infant, you know. And they do have a, a certain scent or smell to them. But there's sometimes... Uh, they have a certain sense you don't want to smell, right? And they need to be changed and they need to be dealt with and taken care of. And we're there to do that. Amen. Parents are there to do that. Yes. I remember one time, uh, I don't even know where Julia went. She went somewhere to, I don't know, grocery shopping or something. The Emily was a baby. And uh, she, she was taking a nap. It was on a Sunday afternoon. She was taking a nap. She was back in the bed. And I heard some racket, some commotion. And I go back there and look, I'm like, What's going on? I walk in the room. I said, you're supposed to be asleep. And she was standing up in a baby bed. I had the, the spindles on the baby bed, you know. She's standing up in the baby bed, holding on to these spindles, and I smelled something. I was like, there's something not right in here. 
Something, something, something's not right in here. Something's happening. And I walk over there, and she has taken her diaper off, slung it all, a diaper all around the baby bed, got on her hands and on the spindles, and she's standing there in the bed looking up at me. And I said, Julia, where are you at? Now, we didn't have cell phones. If we did, they were, you know, didn't work very good. And, uh, and uh, so I couldn't call her and tell her to come home. So I, I pick her up. I, I, I'm walking like this. I got her, and I'm walking through as I carry her through the house. And I put her down in the tub, and I turned the water on. I said, now, be still. Don't move. Don't go anywhere. Don't do anything. Your mama will be right home. <laughs> I said, she'll be right home. And I said, don't you move. Keep you right there. And Julia walked in. She said, what in the world? Why did you just give her a bath? I said, well, I, I got her in the tub. You know, I got the water. I got her some hot water on, you know. But our deal was is that she, she, our deal was that she would change the diapers. If, I would, if any bugs got in the house or spiders, I'd take care of the spiders and the bugs, and she'd take care of the diapers. And that's worked out good. As, as, as a good trade-off, because she can't stand bug. I'm like, it's just a little bug. Get it? No, you get it. And she will not get it. You know what she does? If I'm out of town, I come home and there's a cup in the kitchen floor. Stand up on a ceramic tile. All my girls do that. I walk home and there's, I said, what? I don't even have to ask. I know what it is. There's a bug under the cup on the kitchen floor. And if I'm gone for a couple of days, I don't even have to do anything because I pick up the cup and the bug's dead. They suffocate it for me. See? So they took care of it. Amen. So we don't, you know, kids, we don't expect them just to do things and, and just to grow up at the drop of a hat. And we know they're going to be messy, but we're here to lead, to guide, to teach, and to be there and help them when they fall. See? And when people come to know the Lord, they're going to fall. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to say things that, 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 that's not right to say. They're going to have attitudes. They're going to have some junk and some baggage and some things with them. And we're making room in this building with paint and lights and everything else. But see, we have to make light, room in our hearts, in our lives, that when people come and we go out and, and get people, because that's the only way they're going to come. Amen. It's when we go out and, and we are the light and we are the blessing and we do share. And I'm talking to myself. I'm not condemning anybody. I'm, I'm, not, I'm preaching to myself. And we bring them, then we have to be ready to, for that junk <laughs> to make room. And help them grow, and as they grow, some of that junk will begin to fall off, see. And they'll grow in the knowledge of the truth, and they'll begin to recognize, oh, well, you know, maybe I shouldn't act that way. Maybe, you know, maybe I shouldn't talk that way. Maybe I shouldn't do this. But I love the fish, Bill, but I know you've never caught a fish and it was ready for the frying pan, did you? When, you know, you got off the hook and you pulled it up and it's just all clean, red and scaled. And, no, it doesn't happen that way. So when we catch, if you want to call it that, the Bible says we're fishers of men. They're not ready for the finish, they're not the finished product. There's, there's a process, Amen. see? And thank God we don't have to do the cleaning. The Holy Spirit does the cleaning. Amen. But we're to do the loving. Right. We're to do the guiding. And we're to do the instructing and, and, and to help and to be the assistant. And allow the Holy Spirit to work through us to help that person and help them grow and mature in the things of God. Amen. Amen. Let's go to Matthew 28 real quickly. Matthew chapter 28. Glory to God. Matthew chapter 28, and verse 16. I'll give you a minute to, to get there. I think we got it. We got it on the screen too. Matthew 28, verse 16 says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee. This is the amplified version. Went to the Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed and made an appointment with them. And when they saw him, they fell down and worshiped him, but some doubted. Jesus approached, and breaking the silence, he said to them, All authority, all power of rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go then and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you all the days, perpetually, uniformly, and on every occasion to the very close and consummation of the age. Amen. So this is a commandment from the Lord. Amen. To go into all the world, not just make converts, but uh, to make disciples. Amen. Now go real quick, a couple of books over to the book of John, chapter 13. John, chapter 13. Or if you want to look at the screen, you can do that and follow along with the screen. John, chapter 13, verse 34. John 13, 34 says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as 
Everybody say as. As I have loved you that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that, I, that you are my disciples if you love one another. The Amplified uh, says, I give you a new commandment that you should love me or love one another just as I have loved you, so you too should love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another, if you keep on showing love among yourselves. So this is the way that the world will know that we're his disciples is the love we have for one another. Amen. The way we love one another. Glory to God. So this is a commandment, right? The first one we read, Matthew 28, was a commandment to go and make disciples. And then Jesus said here in John 13, he said, I'm giving you a new commandment to love one another as I've loved you. How did he love you? He loved you when you were wrong. He loved us when we were dead wrong. He loved us while we had no desire to follow him and his kingdom and do things according to his will. He loved us anyway. He knew that. He looked ahead into the future <clears throat> and saw things. And he saw us, and he saw people, and he saw the world that was lost and dying, and he died anyway. He made a choice, amen, amen. to come and to give his life anyway. Glory to God. So now, uh, the, the uh, definition of the word disciple, the noun part of a disciple is a learner or a pupil. It's one who receives or professes to receive instruction from another, a follower, an imitator. And Paul said this. He said, I want, to I want you to pattern your lives after me as I pattern my life after Christ. The verb of disciple is to teach. So that means how, uh, the, the, that we've, we mentioned the noun, but now to put it into action, to disciple someone, the verb is to teach, to train, to bring up. Just like we do children, we teach them, we train them, we bring them up, we raise up children. To make disciples of, to convert to the doctrines or principles. Amen. Convert to someone's teachings, to, to someone's doctrines or principles. And in this case, we're talking about, of course, the word of God. Amen. And then we mentioned this. Don't turn here, but Romans chapter 12, verse 2 tells us what? It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is. That's paraphrasing. And that word transform means a metamorphosis. And we all learn this in school and science class about the, the, the caterpillar and the butterfly. The, the caterpillar goes into the cocoon and the metamorphosis takes place and it comes out a beautiful butterfly. Well, see, that's what happened to us. We didn't just, you know, Brother Hagin said it this way. If you get born again and you had a, a pug nose and, and freckles on your face when you get, before you got born again, when you get born again, you're going to have a pug nose and freckles on your face after you're born again <laughs> because on the, you're the same person. The, 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 the change was made on the inside. See, we made a brand new creation on the inside. The old man that was on the inside is destroyed, and behold, a brand new man is made, a new existence is made on the inside, but we look the same on the outside. And see, with that, we have a flesh and their same habits and tendencies and attitudes and things. And as we renew our mind according to the Word of God, then we make a transformation from living according to the world and having experience in the same things as the world. You see that? Living, if you, if you think according to the world, you're going to have an experience and live just like the world. But if we renew our mind according to the Word, then we'll transform ourselves and we'll begin to live on a different level. We don't have to live like the world lives. Jesus paid a price, Amen. glory to God, for us to live a life of victory. And that's what we're to help people do. We're to help them go through a metamorphosis to where they're changed into what God called in them and created them to be. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Now, uh, turn here real quick to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. I'm going to read this out of the Passion Translation. As you're turning there, we mentioned this last week about fellowship, leadership, statesmanship, horsemanship. That word ship is a suffix, and it, and it uh, notates a condition or a character or office or a skill. Ship, when you see ship on the end of a word, it means that you have a skill in that particular word that it preceded. So fellowship means that you're in a condition or experience in fellowship with a person. Leadership means you have skills of a leader to provide leadership for someone. Horsemanship means that you have a skill to work with a horse or to, to train a horse or to ride horses, right? Well, discipleship means that we're skilled in, in discipleship to lead and to train someone else. Amen. Now, this is a few qualifications of a disciple right here. This is in Luke, uh, where did I tell you to go? Yeah, Luke 9, 23. Let's start verse 23. 
Jesus said to all of his followers, if you truly desire to be my disciple, you must disown your life completely and embrace my cross. Kristen, help me with that. I think it was that first song we sang, some of the lyrics that said, uh, it said, I lay my life, or it was the first or second song, it said, I lay down my life, I surrender now, and I give you everything. So it said, I lay down my life, I surrender everything, something like that, I'm messing it up. Say it one more time. Give you everything. Yes, so that's what a disciple is. And see, we need to ask ourselves that question. Have we truly laid down our life? Have we truly surrendered everything? Amen. Amen. We need to ask ourselves that question. That's what Jesus asked him here. He said, if you truly desire to be my disciple, you must disown your life completely. Embrace my cross as your own and surrender to my ways. For if you choose self-sacrifice, giving up your lives for my glory, you'll discover true life. But if you choose to keep your lives for yourselves, you will lose what you try to keep. Even if you gained all the wealth and power of the world and all the things it, it could offer you, you've lost your soul in the pro, uh, process. What good is that? So why then are you ashamed of being my disciple? Are you ashamed of the revelation, tr revelation truth that I give you? I, the Son of Man, will one day return in my radiant brightness with the holy angels and in the splendor of majesty of my Father. And on that day, I will, I will be ashamed of everyone who has been ashamed of me. Amen. Well, we want him to not be ashamed, right? Amen. Not be ashamed of us. But we need to ask ourselves that question. Are we laying our lives down? Are we truly following Christ with everything? Amen. Amen. Um, don't turn here because I, I want to quote it. We've already, we've already turned there. But it's in John 13, 33 through 35. This is in the, the Passion Translation. It says, for when you demonstrate the same love that I have for you by loving one another, everyone will know that you're my true followers. So see, when we love people the way he loved us, it, it does take a laying down of our uh, desires sometimes. Because how many of you know we, we have, it's just like a kid, if you go in the nursery and the kid's playing with a toy and you go up there and take that toy away, how many know there's going to be a reaction? <laughs> it's going to be a reaction. Well, sometimes even as adults, we have things that we enjoy, and that's gonna, God wants us to enjoy life. That's not what I'm saying. But we can't allow the things, we can't allow the, the desires that we have or the goals or the dreams that, that we think that we have to, to overshadow what he's created us to do Amen. and what he's commanded us to do as, as a believer, as a disciple, as his follower. So sometimes there will be a laying down of our will. There will be a laying down of our desires in order to pick up the cross and do what he said to do. Do you hear me today? And there may be a little pain involved. There may be a little persecution involved. There may be a little hurt involved. Amen? And we don't like to talk about that, but it's the truth. But when we do that, that's when we gain true riches. That's when we gain true life and true happy and, uh, happiness and true fulfillment. Amen. Amen? When we do that, glory to God. Now, this is a, a quote about leadership here. It says, the goal is not simply for you to cross the finish line and see how many but, but to see how many people you can inspire to run with you. Now, uh, this is Simon Sinek. Some of you heard of him, but I want to read it again. The goal is not simply for you to cross the finish line, but for you to see how many people you can inspire to run with you. So last week I mentioned this to you. The goal is not simply to make it to heaven, but to see how many people you can take with you. Amen. See, not just cross the finish line and say, I made it. But how many people can we influence in this life to take with us? Amen. The greatest contribution of a leader is to make other leaders. And then I said this, the greatest contribution of a disciple is to make other disciples. So that's the greatest con contribution we can make as the follower of Jesus is to make other disciples. Amen. Amen. Make other disciples. Yes. Glory to God. I, I, I don't even remember where I heard this a few weeks ago. I heard an advertisement on the radio, and it was about this business called uh, Dashworthy was the name of it. I thought... Dashworthy, man, that kind of resonates in me. So Dashworthy, what is that? What is that? So I Googled it, and it's a company that helps people find their purpose in life through uh, business and other means, and they help, you know, sometimes people just need a little encouragement. They need a little help, and that's what this business does. It's a ministry. It's somebody's business that they consider a ministry, and they help people fulfill the plan of God for their life, and they call it Dashworthy. 
And you've all heard the story about that you look at someone's tombstone and it's got, you know, 19 whatever or whatever the day they was born to the day they passed, and in the middle there's a dash. And people told the story, there's a whole story about it, is what does the dash mean? What did that, that dash in the middle represents what we did with our life, the differences we made, the sacrifices that we made, the people that we reached and touched, that dash in the middle. And see, we need to, we need to make sure that when we, when our life comes to a close or before Jesus returns, what, what we're doing with our life, is it dash worthy? Is, is it worthy of the price that Jesus paid for our life? Or is it just something we're doing to, to live and we're just here taking up space? But is it dash worthy? Ask yourself that question. Is what I'm doing today, is it worthy of the life of Jesus that he paid for and what he's called me to do? Amen. Uh, now, see, we, we have to have a, the proper perspective. Now, let's, let's turn to this verse. What did I tell you to go last? Go to Matthew, uh, go to Matthew 9. Matthew chapter 9. Let's look at verse uh, 35. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. I got me a Bible. It's got some bigger print than this one, but this is my favorite Bible. It's got the Amplified and the King James. So this is my favorite Bible. This is one I like to, to preach out of. Sometimes the word like they got smaller. So I had to get my amplifiers out. Uh, 9 verse 35. And the King James said, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing the sick, every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then he said unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray you therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. The Amplified Version says, So pray to the Lord of the harvest to force out and to thrust out laborers into the harvest. Now I want you to notice the... the uh, the way that Jesus perceived the people here. He looked at the people and he didn't, he, he didn't tell them to move away. You see what I'm saying? He didn't tell them to go. The disciples wanted to tell them to leave and to, to go away, but Jesus didn't do that. Jesus wanted them to stay and he looked at them and he said, I perceive that they're like sheep without a shepherd. I believe it's the passage translation. It said, uh, there's not enough harvesters to bring it all in. And he said, go and, and plead uh, with the owner of the harvest to thrust out more laborers and more people to bring in the grain. He said they look like they're bewildered and harassed and distressed. They're dejected and helpless. That's the way he saw these people. And I want to ask you today, what perspective do we have of people? So we have to change our perspective to see people the way Jesus saw people. Now, I remember being on the mission field. Uh, I'm not going to use that photo, Elliot, that I told you about. But I, I was on the mission field. It was last year. We were, I know Pastor C is coming next week, but we were on the mission field last year. And uh, we were preaching in this mountain. And, I mean, we'd driven for hours, probably eight or nine hours. And we were up way up high on this mountain, and we had preached the gospel, and, and we were packing up and getting ready to go to the next village. And we drove on up, and we kept driving and driving. I think, man, when are we going to stop? We finally stopped, and we got out of the van. And the, and, uh, the, the interpreter I was with, I said, uh, I looked down the mountain. I said, where did we come from? And they said, you came from right down here. And he pointed down, and I looked down and saw the roof of a building. I said, man, we came from there. We were all the way down there. And he said, yeah, you were way down there. And all of a sudden, now we're way up here. And man, I'm looking, I'm thinking, man, that's a drop right there. That's a long way. Well, we preached the gospel there. We moved on up to a higher place. But this time, they could only take a four-wheel drive, and everybody couldn't go. They said, we need four or five people, uh, four or five people to go. And they said, we're going to take this smaller truck, four-wheel drive. We've got to go up to this other village and take some blankets. Who wants to go? So four or five of us went. We get up there. We preached the gospel, give the blankets and everything out to them. Several people get saved and healed. It's a glorious time. And we get ready to pack up and leave. And the, and the pastor that was there with us, he said, uh, he said, someday, he said, we need to go beyond this. I said, well, where else is there to go? I thought heaven's the only next stop. I mean, we're in the clouds. I mean, there's, I've, got, <clears throat> I've got pictures of it where the, I mean, the clouds are coming through. They're coming through the village. 
This is not fog. This is a cloud. And he was there talking to me, and he said, look, he said, right here, this road, this little, it wasn't a road, it was a little cattle trail, really. He said, it continues on for several miles. And he said, the only way you can get there, he said, I can't even take this truck. He said, the only way you can get there is by foot or pack animal. He said, one day, we, we, he said, I believe we'll go and we'll reach these other villages you can't get to by truck. And I said, sign me up, let's go, you know. So what it does is it, cha it changed my perspective. You know, I was, I was at one level and I was at another level and then we got up to another one. He said, well, this is not even it. There's people up higher than that. And when you get up 17,000, 18,000 feet, man, you're up there. You're up there. Dennis has been there, <laughs> some of those places. So it changes perspective. Well, see, that's what we've got to do. We've got to change our perspective and see people the way that Jesus sees people. Amen. Amen. See, when you've got an investment in something, it changes the way that you see it. Yeah. Right? It changes the way that you see it. How many of you know Jesus invested everything? Yeah. He invested everything into us because he, made, he invested his entire life. You know, it makes me think about growing up. Uh, you know, I had a motorcycle and and then I went from a motorcycle, well, I had a, a, a tricycle first. Then I went from the tricycle to the bicycle. Then I went from my bicycle to my motorcycle. I had about three or four motorcycles. And then I finally got to a car. But see, there were certain things when I got older that I began to work for and cut grass and do different things. And, and I would make money to help pay for And then I got a job and I had to pay for my own truck. I remember the first time I met Julia, it was at a car wash. And uh, I mean, we didn't even really speak to each other. This was about a year before we actually went out on a date. But I met her at a car wash, and I pulled my motorcycle up, and it was her church having a car wash. And I pulled it up, and I said, how much is the car wash? She said, $5, and I, or whoever was there. I don't even know if it was her I was talking to. So I gave him a 10, and I said, uh, but I want to borrow your uh, supplies. They said, what are you talking about? I said, well, I, I'm going to wash it because my motorcycle. <laughs> I said, but I want to give you a donation for your church, but I'm going to wash it because it was my motorcycle, and I didn't want somebody spraying water all up in the everywhere in the motor and everywhere else, and I wanted to wash it. So I got the bucket and the soap, and, you know, I washed it up, rinsed it, and told them thank you for allowing me to do it. But, see, I had an investment in that motorcycle, so I had, you know, I had some skin in the game. You see what I'm saying? I, I, I thought more about that motorcycle than they did because I'm the one to pay for it. I cut a lot of grass. I washed a lot of dishes at the restaurant, bust a lot of tables to get that motorcycle. And I didn't want anybody to ruin it. I wanted it to run good because if it broke down, guess who's going to pay for it? Me. I'm going to pay for it. Not mom and daddy because they couldn't. I'm going to pay for it. Or well, one of them could, but they chose not to, but one of them couldn't. And so that meant I was going to pay for it. So I had some investment in it, see. I looked at it different. And that's the way it is in our life when we invest into something. See, a business owner of a company has, more of a, has a different outlook of a company than someone who just considers themselves an employee. We went into Panda Express a few weeks ago. And, and, and man, I thought, man, these employees, they, man, these are out of sight. I mean, they need to, I, I think Chick-fil-A trained these people. Maybe they were, all of them worked at Chick-fil-A and they came over here to Panda Express. I mean, they, they were, you know, how are you doing today? Is there anything else I can get you? They come out to the table. Is there, you know, you need any more sauce? You need it? And I thought, man, these, man somebody trained these people right. And there was a table over here beside us. as a man and his little boy. And uh, about 10 minutes later, they got up and walked out. And I heard him speaking to someone at the door. And there was somebody coming in for a job interview. And the man sitting beside me was the owner. And the reason the employees were acting the way they was acting because the owner was sitting in the, in the building, <laughs> see. And he got up to interview the guy, and uh, they talked a minute, and he walked out. And as soon as he walked out, I looked up at the counter, and there's three of them up here with a phone texting. <laughs> you know, they stand up here on the hot bar with the food, where the food's at. And instead of checking to see if everything's ready, they're over there texting, sending messages to everybody, walking around, you know, joking, and the whole thing changed. Well, see, they don't have the same investment in that business as the owner does. Amen. So the reason I'm using these examples is this, is when we take time to invest in the people, and I'm getting ready to close with that, when we take time to invest in the people, you say, how do we do that? Well, we do it by making room in our life. We do it by making a phone call. We do it by paying a visit. We do it by going and inviting them to a place to where we can begin to disciple them as the Spirit of God opens the door. See, the Spirit of God will open the door, but we have to be willing to walk through it. We have to be willing to take them to a restaurant. We have to be willing to meet them at their home or our home or at the park or wherever and began to pour into them and disciple them. He'll open the door, but we have to be willing to step through. And when you do, you'll have an investment in that person. And when you have an investment in that person, you'll see them differently. See, instead of thinking, what good will it do? And, and see, we've all had people that probably looked at us that way. I know I had people that looked at me that way. They looked at me and they said, well, what good would it do to, 
do anything for him. He's, he, he's this, this, that, and the other. What good would it do for, for me to share that with him? Because he won't ever change. He won't ever make any difference. He won't ever, see, thank God, God didn't look at us that way. Amen? He didn't look at us that way. He made an investment. So we begin to invest in the people, then it'll make a difference. Glory to God. It made me think about uh, the story of, of uh, my brother. Uh, a lot of you here today knew my brother. He's in heaven now. A lot of you here knew him. Uh, but I, I preached his funeral back in 2020. He moved on to heaven in May of, uh, of 2020. And uh, so I was preaching his funeral. And I got there the day. And uh, I was just uh, walked up to the pulpit. You know, it was kind of a hard thing to do as my brother. And, uh, but I knew he wanted me to do it. And uh, so I had some notes prepared. I had some things prepared in my heart, you know, the Spirit of the Lord wanted me to say. So I go up to the podium, and I began to look out. And it, was, it was in a church. It was, they were having church in an a old theater. So the, the, the podium, everything's here. Well, the, the seats were the fold-out seats for a theater, and they go up, you know, on a rise up. And there's people, pretty good amount of people there, 250 people or so. But as I'm looking at the faces, there's not a whole lot of faces I recognize. There's not a whole lot of faces that I, that I know. There's not a whole lot of family members there. There's not a whole lot of uh, people I'm familiar with. But I'll never forget the church, all of you, that, a lot of you that's here today was there that day. And I'm thankful for that. I appreciate that. There were certain family members that were there that I'll never forget that they were there. There was a cousin of mine that we're not, we don't talk very often, but he was there, him and his wife, and I'll never forget that. I never forget it. There were certain friends of my brother's that I remembered he had in high school. There was a friend he had in college when he took drafting. Uh, that's a school teacher over in Selma to this day, and he was there. He drove, took a day off, and drove up there. He was there. There was just different ones, you know. And that's what I'm telling you. That's reading. It's so important that you make a difference in someone's life, that you speak into their life, that you show you care, and see. And those people had made differences in my brother's life, and they were the ones that was there. They were the ones that were they were important. And he was important to them. But see, there was a lot of people that had written him off. A lot of people said, you know, ah, he's no good. You know, ah, he lived this way and that way, and he made all these wrong choices, and he, he had wronged people. And the truth of it was, yes, he wronged people. The truth of it was, yes, he made a lot of bad choices. The truth was, yes, he stole some things from people. The truth was, yes, he lied to some people. That's the truth. He did a lot of those things. And there was a lot of even family members that he did those, those things to that wrote him off, and they didn't even take the time to come to his funeral. Why? Because they had written him off as being no good, not worthy, not worthy of my time to go. <laughs> and that's the reason I'm sharing this today is because we have to be careful with our perspective of how we look at people. Amen. They are worthy. Amen. Jesus gave everything. They are worthy. So how do you see people today? Do you see people, like Jesus said, that they're harassed by the enemy? They're scattered like sheep without a shepherd. Do you see them as harvest that's white, ready for harvest? And that we're praying that the, the Lord of the harvest would thrust us out and give us opportunities, and he does every week, that we're willing to take that door of opportunity. But I want to tell you this, what happened. As I preached the funeral, and I shared the things that I believe the Lord told me to share, but most of the room was filled with people. He had just, about uh, a year previous to his passing, he had finished a recovery program. And he was, uh, he was actually on staff at the recovery program. It was really a, a volunteer role, but he was, he was on staff at that recovery program. There was over 100 different men. And uh, the room was filled with people that had been through that recovery. The most of the people there was the ones that was from that recovery program. And what happened when I said the last scripture that I read, or I prayed the last pray that, prayer that I prayed, and I closed my Bible, and I dismiss, and I'm standing in front of the people, and people come down to console me. Most of the people that came down and talked to me were the ones that had been through the recovery program that my brother had been uh, influenced on in their life in a positive way. Amen. I had people come down and said, I just want to tell you how thankful I am that your brother came to me in the middle of the night, and I was having withdrawals, and he came and he held my hand, and he talked me through the night and prayed me to help me get through the night. Amen. There was mothers and fathers that came and said that my well, I remember one father said that my son was in a closet in an abandoned house. 
And I said I wasn't going to get <laughs> emotional about this. Amen. Uh, hallelujah. Amen. Uh, and the father said, my son was in a closet of an abandoned house. And your brother came and he pulled him out. And he took him in. And, uh, and he saved his life that night. There was over a dozen people that came and thanked me and parents that came and thanked me for the difference that my brother had made in their life and for talking them through in the darkest hours of their life. And yes, he made a lot of bad decisions. He made a lot of bad choices. But Jesus never wrote him off. And he made a lot of difference in a lot of people's lives. So I'm telling you today as we're finishing up is don't ever write anyone off. Don't ever say that they're a lost cause and lost case. Because you don't know the difference that you make. The one word that you give and the encouragement that you give, you'll never know what difference that it'll make. So I want to leave you today and challenge you with these last uh, few words and thoughts. I want you to love the ones that you have influence with. Starting with your family members and those that you have influence that, that, that are in your close community. Love those people. Love the ones that the Holy Spirit leads you to. Be the disciple in the discipleship. Amen. Amen. Without us, like I mentioned, without us, discipleship can't take place. It won't happen. Jesus is not there to do it, like I mentioned. The angels aren't there to do it. Chat BT, GPT is not going to do it. Holy Spirit lives in us, and he's counting on us to do it. Amen. So we must be motivated by the why. The why is what? The why, number one, is Jesus, Jesus gave us a command to do it. Go and make disciples. The second commandment is Jesus gave us commandment to love one another the same way he loved us. And by that, all men would know that we're truly his disciples. So I want to ask you this. Who does God keep putting in your heart? Ask yourself that question today. Who does God keep putting on your heart? Who does the Holy Spirit keep revealing before you and bringing it into your remembrance and saying, go speak, go talk, go visit, go call, go write a letter, go love on them, be a, be a blessing to them. Help them come up. See, we, we have the truth. We have the gospel. We have the answer. We have the words of eternal life. We have the words of abundant life. But it's that truth that we know that sets others free. And we need to take that truth to them to help them be set free. But who is it he's put on our heart? And have we opened our eyes to see the harvest like Jesus told his disciples to do? He said, open up your eyes. Look. So I want to encourage you today as you go out, open your eyes. Look. When you go into a restaurant, open your eyes and look. When you go to work, the next time you go to work, open your eyes and look. When you go to school, when you go to wherever it is that you go to, the places that you're around, open your eyes and do you see harvest? Or do you see people that aren't worth it? Do you see people that, what difference does it make? Because it does make a difference. It makes a big difference. Amen? You'll never know what difference it'll make on somebody's life. I don't have a, let's see if I got it right here. As we close today, I, I, I wanna, I'm not going to personally give it to you. We got it out on the table. Uh, if you have, have, how many of you have seen the movie? If you hadn't, I want to tell you about it. When we're done. I close my Bible so you, you don't have to be nervous. I'm not going to turn to another scripture. But uh, have any of you seen the movie After Death? Have you heard of the movie? It's called After Death. It's the same studio, Angel Studios, that made the, the uh, Chosen series. It's called After Death. You can go on uh, Amazon and get it. Amazon Prime It's like $12, $14 to get it. Or you can pay 20 something and buy it and you have the movie. You own it. You can share it. But it's about experiences of people that are at the point of death and they leave their body and they can see things going on in the room. It's, I mean, it's an amazing movie. Amazing the things that happen. Some of them go to heaven to see Jesus. Some of them come back into the body. Some of them go to hell. And there's one man that, uh, he was a cocaine addict and he was on his bed, uh, had snorted a bunch of cocaine. He was laid on his bed and he was actually trying to kill himself. He was laid on his bed and he said the whole room was spinning. He said his heart was about to beat out of his chest about to come out of his chest and he said well, he was laying there thinking this is the end this is the end this is the end but it just wasn't happening so he went and he did some more cocaine 
because he wanted to just end it. So he went and did some more cocaine, and he said all of a sudden he could feel himself leaving his body. But some people, when they leave their body, they feel themselves go up. And most of the people, and this is uh, research has been done over 20 plus years. Doctors and different people from all over the world come together and they share their experiences, notes. They didn't even know they were taking notes and, and investigating all these things, and they met each other and some found out some of them have been doing it 20 years ago, interviewing people and taking notes. And, and a lot of them come up. Granted, this is the same experience that Granny West says. She, they, they come up out of their body, and it's like they're about the roof level or up in the ceiling, and they can see down their body and see things going on in the room around them, whether a hospital room or an accident or whatever. They can see things happening and going on. Well, this man, instead of going up, he's laying on his bed and did some more cocaine because he wanted to end his life. He starts to go down. And he's going down and he's going down. He said, it's getting darker and it's getting darker and he's, and he's falling and he's falling and he's falling. And all of a sudden he's thinking, well, this can't be happening. He said, you know, really? He said, I'm a, I'm a good person. He said, I've been really good in my life. I've done good things. I've loved on people. And he said, I've never, you know, really done a whole lot wrong to people. And he said, all of a sudden it started getting faster. When he started talking about how good he had been, the good things he had done, it started dropping faster and faster and faster and faster. And he finally gets to hell and he said, these creatures come and get him just terrible, hideous-looking creatures come and get him, and they begin to lead him off and drag him off. And he said he's scratching and trying to, you know, stay where he is, trying to keep him from getting him, and they just drag him, and they're dragging him along, and it gets darker and darker and darker, and they get him to a place, and he said he's laying on his back, and he said these creatures start to uh, uh, bite on him and scratch him, and they're biting on his body. And he said, all of a sudden, he said, I'm looking up, and he said, I can't see anything but total darkness. And he said, just... Just like that, he said, I remember it in my heart. He said, I remember as a little bit of kid of going to somebody's Sunday school. And he said, hearing about a man called Jesus and hearing about that he had paid the price for our sins. And he said, all of a sudden, he said, I just cried out. He said, if Jesus, if you're really real, if, you're really, uh, uh, if you really exist, he said, I'm calling out to you now. Please save me. Save me from this hell and from this torment. And he said, it's just like that when he called out to Jesus. He said, man, immediately he shot up and started shooting up and he could see a light. And it started getting brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter until they shot up into a place where she knew was heaven. But see, what I want you to realize is, is how important it is that that one Sunday school teacher shared Jesus with that man that day. Because if he hadn't heard, if he didn't know, then he would have stayed in that, that place of hell, that place of torment. Another man that had the same type of experience, he went to heaven. And he told Jesus, he said, I'll do anything you tell me to do. I'll go anywhere you tell me to go. And Jesus told him, he said, go back and love the people that you're with. And, Jesus, and he's like, is that it? Is that all? That won't work. And he said, yes, go back and love the people that you're with. Go back, love your wife, love your family, love those people that you're around, the, the close people that you have influence with. Love those people. And he said, my, my word is, is a seed. My love is a seed, and it'll grow exponentially. He said, if you love one, it'll spread to the next one. And that's the way the early church grew, is they went for what? Daily from house to house loving on people, and it grew exponentially. And that's what he went back and did, even though he had some, uh, <laughs> he had some persecution that took place. But I, I encourage you, go, watch, go get that movie and watch it. Now, before I let you go, right here is a list. It's back on the table, the green table with the tablecloth there. Go back and pick it up, and it's got a list on the back of a 10 most wanted list. You can fill it out. You may not, you say, well, I don't have 10 people. Well, you may not, but you may have one or two or three. And this on the front is an acronym, is that right? Who's an English student? What is it when you take the word and you make a, you take each first letter of the word as an acronym? Is that right? So as I was studying on this, the Lord gave me an acronym for a disciple. So I took the word of each first letter or the letter of each letter in disciple and I made a sentence with it that the Holy Spirit gave me. And I want you to take it, it's out there on the table. Take it, read over it, and it's talking about how do we disciple others. And it goes through and it tells us and explains us in a very simple way how we do it. How, we, how do we disciple? How can we get involved about praying, about leading, about encouraging? And then on the back, it's got your list. So you don't have to make it public. You don't have to show it to people. But take one. It's on the back table. And I'm telling you, God will open doors. Amen? And we're making room. Like I said, we're making room in the church, but we have to make room in our hearts. As we make room in our hearts and the Holy Spirit will open doors. Amen. Let's pray before we dismiss. Father, we thank you today for your goodness, for your grace, your mercy, for your love. We thank you, Lord, for loving us when we didn't deserve to be loved. We thank you, Father, for sending Jesus. When we had no desire to follow you or to follow after your ways or your kingdom, you looked ahead into the year 
even this year, the year of 2024, Father, and you saw people that were lost. You saw people that were, were going to be in need of a Savior and a healer and a deliverer. And you chose to willingly hang on that cross and give up your, your life and die and even suffer in the pits of hell for a humanity that had no desire to follow you. That's how much you loved us. So, Father, I thank you that we see ourselves as valuable. We see ourselves as kings and priests. We see ourselves as ambassadors, Father, that you've called, that you believe in, that you've commissioned. And, Father, we'll not take those things lightly, but we'll see ourselves that way and we'll make a decision. We'll make a commitment to go and to make disciples, Father God. We ask you, Holy Spirit, now, as we make a place in our hearts, as we make a place in our lives to be uh, to get a little messy, to get involved, to jump in with both feet, Father God, in somebody else's life, in somebody else's mess, to lead them, to bring them into the eternal and abundant life that we experience, Father God. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to, to, to reveal to us, Father God, those people. Show us their face. Give us their names, Father God. Open up doors of opportunity for us to minister and to disciple those people, Father God. And we'll, by faith, we'll take those steps and we'll listen to Holy Spirit and to his ability. It's his ability, his equipping, Father God, that we'll get the job done. We praise you and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Well, glory be to God. You're dismissed.